else the post office has to say about uh, um, their diligence, um, so too for you to come out uh, on an evening like this. So um, I am Hasia Diner, I'm a professor here at NYU in the History Department and in Hebrew and Judaic Studies. Uh, but last year I had the uh, distinct honor, with not too much uh, preparation, to uh, step in and be the interim director of Ireland House. And um, it was a um, wonderful opportunity to learn, to grow, to meet uh, wonderful people. And um, it so happened that uh, before I, uh, independent of my having been asked to take over, uh, Ireland House decided to dedicate its 25th anniversary year to a uh, long set of programs focusing on the uh, Irish Jewish encounter in America and uh, beyond. Um, so uh, when I heard that, um, uh, my first thought was that uh, uh, James Carroll should be the, uh, one of the speakers in this series. So let me have just one minute of your time because you're not here to, uh, you, if you come last February, you would have heard me, but you didn't come tonight to do that. You came uh, to hear um, uh, James Carroll, but I do want to just make a few very brief points. And, one, um, I feel I must say that uh, uh, when we were planning this, who would have thought that we would be hearing a lecture like this a few weeks um, after such a uh, horrendous event as what happened in uh, Pittsburgh. And um, while um, the event so jolting and tragic is um, not the subject tonight, it is also something that we cannot uh, uh, um, put aside when we hear uh, these uh, words uh, tonight. Um, so too, when we were planning this event and uh, fiddling around with, time, with dates, um, it did not uh, register with me that we would be having this talk just a week after the 80th anniversary of Kristallnacht. And uh, that, in fact, uh, offers us a little bit of a segue uh, into the um, program we're having tonight in as much as um, just last week um, in the archives of Catholic University, uh, in an archive that, in a find uh, in, in the university's archives, um, someone discovered a um, set of uh, records, uh, that is L photograph records, of a um, speech uh, given um, uh, by, entitled The Catholic Protest Against Nazism, November 16th, 1938. And uh, in that uh, uh, record, we get a very different kind of picture of the um, uh, Catholic Church's uh, engagement with, uh, with Kristallnacht. Um, it was a half hour program with Catholic bishops from across the nation. It included um, former Governor Al Smith, um, all condemning Nazism and expressing solidarity with the uh, Jews living under uh, Nazi rule. So I think that just offers us a little bit of a moment in historic time as a prelude to the uh, wonderful remarks we're going to hear tonight by James Carroll, the author of um, 12 novels, eight works of nonfiction. And I think the one that um, so many of us are familiar with, uh, one that is um, I think definitely in the category now of a classic, uh, which was uh, Constantine's Sword, a book that I think will uh, endure uh, for uh, many, many, many decades to come, a study of um, the relationship between the Catholic Church, the Jews, and anti-Semitism. So uh, without further ado, Thank you, Professor Diner, uh, Miriam Nyan. Nyan, thank you so much for your welcome. I'm, I can't tell you how pleased I am to be here. Uh, to, I can't quite claim it as a homecoming, but I did have with Lexa a wonderful uh, time here a couple of years ago as a visiting writer. Her class left me in her office. Uh, when I was here, uh, John Sexton made sure I was welcome and stayed, kept me out of trouble. Um, it's great to be able to acknowledge you both. Lex and I had a great time here, and I love NYU, have regarded it with respect and affection for many years, but now feel, I hope not presumptuously, a personal connection to it. And of course, uh, nothing 
uh, ratifies that for me more than uh, the island house, given my own strong identity as an Irish American, a citizen of the Republic, uh, a man whose life has been shaped in so many precious ways by my Irish heritage. So thank you for having me. The Jews, the Irish, and a challenge to Catholic anti-Semitism, a Boston story. It's actually two Boston stories. My first friend was named Peter Sisman. He lived in the house next door in our chipper new suburb of Washington, D.C. This was in about 1950. That Peter and I were neighbors was a signal of a large change that had just occurred in the handful of years since my birth in St. Gabriel's Parish on the south side of Chicago. My mother and father had been raised in the cramped Irish Catholic world of Chicago's Hard Scrabble Stockyards District, what I learned to call Mayor Daly's neighborhood. They were, and their like, were forever identified by their home parish, a word that gives us parochial. But that changed just then. Like legions of other citizens, they had come to Washington, D.C. during what was referred to simply as the war. My dad, having left the stockyards behind, began as a spy-catching FBI agent, but soon became an Air Force officer. During the war, narrowly identified Americans from widely different backgrounds had been thrown together in the foxholes and cockpits and tin cans and battlefields, the dogfights, the war zones of the Pacific and Europe. And just so, in the boom of the post-war America, all over the country, these veterans found themselves moving into newly built suburban tracks, cheek by jowl, with people they would never have met a mere decade before, much less befriended. Our new suburb was in Virginia, not far from the Pentagon, where Dad worked for most of my growing up years. The development known as Holland Hills was a so-called modernist phenomenon. You can picture it, boxy houses with butterfly roofs, vertical wood siding, expansive glass windows, brick floors, oversailing second stories. The mode had originated in pre-war Europe a conscious repudiation of old-fashioned aesthetic mores that the war had then reduced to rubble in cities across the continent. In transit to America, the popularized mid-century modernism of houses like ours starkly overthrew the traditional colonial and Georgian styles that should have defined the home ownership dream of conventionally minded people like my parents, that they fell instantly in love with such radically unornamented architecture, showed how their imaginations too had been unknowingly upended, preparing them for wholly new ideas of what was beautiful. Their ideas of the good were upended too, which was not altogether clear to us, but a hint of that transformation could be found in the facts that our nearest neighbors were Jewish, and that by my parents, in my hearing at least, that was unremarked upon. What I knew about Peter was that he was a little taller than I was, and completely free of freckles which were the bane of my existence. I envied his sandy brown hair. Peter, never Pete, could whistle his dog home. He could leap across the nearby creek in one bound. He could outrun a milk truck. 
He could lead the way in squeezing between the slats of the fence and cro enclosing the construction yard where we went for cast off nails and discarded boards. We were building a tree house. He could climb from one branch to the next while balancing a hammer and our loot, which made him the perfect partner for such a project. I had brothers as playmates, but Peter offered an invitation to a wider world. Accepting it, I laid first stones along the path that would take me out there, out here. And I still think of this chum with gratitude. On Saturdays, I would often awaken ready to rush out into the woods across the street, where I would wait for him to show up at our tree. One sweltering day, I said, let's go to the swimming pool. We could ride our bikes. He replied matter-of-factly, we don't go there. That's a club, and we're Jews. Bellhaven was an old Virginia country club, a mile or two away. I did not know it until years later, but my father, who joined for the golf course, had been one of the first Catholics to be admitted as a member. This, too, reflected a post-war slackening of strictures, but the slackening went only so far. Catholics, perhaps. Jews, never. There were blacks at the club, of course, the caddies. I took for granted the pleasures of the swimming pool, the billiards room with a ping pong table, chips for cash, snack bar. But Peter's remark, the snap of a barbed whip, punctured my innocence about the country club. This was a first lesson in the rubrics of exclusion, an initiation into an ostracizing which, when its unbounded scope showed itself much later, would naturally appall me. We're Jews. Jews was a word I had heard then, only at church. But I knew what mattered. When the Roman governor, Pontius Pilate, proposed the release of innocent Jesus, Jews were the ones who cried out, crucify him, crucify him. I knew that the Jews were the money changers whose tables Jesus overturned in the temple, leading to his arrest in Jerusalem. I knew that Jews hatefully dogged Jesus as he went about Galilee, preaching love. Jesus was my intimate friend, and Jews were his enemies. I knew that. What I did not know was that, actually, Jews were real. That there were Jews alive in the world I inhabited. Peter was a Jew? That my friend made such a momentous admission with such unfeigned nonchalance only confounded my astonishment. If Peter was the enemy of Jesus, what could Peter be to me? I do not recall what, if anything, I replied to his statement. Yet somehow the ground had shifted under our friendship. And I had been given a problem, whether my apparently accepting friend had a problem or not. Peter and I, both second or third graders, went to separate schools. I attended St. Mary's, the parochial school in Alexandria, which, unlike the walk-to-school parishes of my parents' Chicago, was a 15-minute drive away. Peter went to what I thought of as the Protestant school, the public school, a 10-minute stroll from our houses. Though in my intimate memories of Peter, that treehouse, our romping through the woods, our searching for arrowheads along the sandy banks of the creek, 
it is always summertime or Saturday. In fact, our separate schools had kept us well apart most of the time. St. Mary's was the realm of nuns, Holy Cross sisters whose stiff white headdresses looked like halos, which was to a seven-year-old signal enough. In their black habits, they glided so smoothly across the linoleum floors that it took a leap of faith to believe that they had legs and feet like the rest of us. They carried metal clickers, one crack of which could jolt an entire bustling classroom into silence. Their most emphatic instruction concerned the Catholic catechism, and I took in its absolutes, absolutely. Question, why did God make me? Answer, to know, love, and serve him in this life, and to be happy with him in the next. This life, next life. That distinction fixed my economy of time, and soon enough, it defined the brackets of my comprehension. To my mind, the largest note of the Catholic faith was rendered in a slogan, which may have been the first phrase I ever memorized. No salvation outside the church. It's also likely that my first Latin words were nulla salus, which was the shorthand for the dogma commonly referred to. I do not know why this of all Catholic maxims was the one to lodge most firmly in my nascent consciousness, but I suspect it did so because around then I was ushered to the lip of the high ledge that overlooked the pit of hell. Gripped by the gulf between this life and the next, my childish imagination was entirely taken over by the threat of infinite and eternal doom. I am sure the first renditions I ever saw of naked men and women were picture book images of the damned, Dante's Inferno meets Dracula's Lair. I can remember the images now. Even the anguish of impossibly twisted bodies might have remained abstract as a fate threatening me, except for the gruesome detail that defined every illustration I saw, and that was fire. Hell was a lake of fire. There would be infinite pain, as a nun explained to us, with the infinite capacity to feel it, and it would never stop. In the afterlife, sister said, our flesh would burn but not be consumed. The fire would never go out. We would never get free of it. I would later realize that the nun, whether consciously or not, was imitating the vivid sadism of the Jesuit retreat master whom James Joyce presents as the torturer of Stephen Dedalus. But Joyce's hero had the advantage of adulthood, or near adulthood. The horror of hell was presented to me at an age when perceptions are acute precisely for being unable to distinguish between the actual and the fancied. So of course I took sisters every word as a literal description of the real. I felt the heat, I smelled the sulfur, I heard the shrieking. Obsessed, I tested my dread one day by putting my finger to a candle to see if I could stand the pain of the flame. When my skin blistered, I hid it from my mother, certain that I had committed the sin. It was around this time that I was required to learn by heart the act of contrition, the catechism's antidote to eternal damnation, Sorrow for sins could merit God's forgiveness, which should have been a consolation. But in my case, the antidote was a new poison because the act 
required me to declare that my repentance was motivated by the pure love of God, quote, not because I dread the loss of heaven and fear the pains of hell, unquote, but such dread and fear were precisely and exclusively what made me sorry. So even in my penitence, I was telling a lie, yet another sin, I was, I was a candidate for hell. Once I was introduced to this image of a possible future, I began to experience it as a present desolation, especially in the middle of the night, when I would be shaken awake by that classic dream of falling, which in my case was always falling into the flaming pit. So when the idea of no salvation outside the church was first explained to me, I took it mainly as good news since salvation was the essence of rescue from the lake of fire. And we Catholics, when properly absolved from sin by our priest, were assured of being saved. Yet the eternal beatitude of heaven was never as vivid to me as the relief of being spared from hell. This joy, of course, was a version of pleasure at not being hit by a hammer anymore. But I nonetheless loved the church for its promise. Having remembered that I was a Catholic, I could go back to sleep without fear of falling. It did not dawn on me at first that our positive Catholic faith was paired to the infinitely negative fate of others, probably because I had yet to reckon with who, precisely, the poor, banished figures of the inevitably damned might be. But Peter? It's hard to credit such a mean-spirited doctrine now, thank goodness, much less the meanness of imposing it on children. But this, you're damned, we're not, edict, possessed a certain logic. Jesus has long been regarded by Christians as the one way to God, and the church understands itself as the way to Jesus. The Gospel of Mark has Jesus putting the idea this way. He who believes and is baptized will be saved, but he who does not believe will be condemned. That grim idea was counterbalanced in the New Testament, it's true, by numerous assertions of God's unconditional love for all. But it came to dominate theology morphing into a kind of imperialistic claim for Roman Catholicism. It became a barbed, barbed dogma in the Middle Ages. Catholic prelates presiding as gatekeepers of the afterlife as a way of being powerful in this life. No salvation outside the church became a weapon of exclusion when formally pronounced by numerous papal bulls and church councils as popes competed with kings and princes for political power in Christendom. The threat of damnation in the next world assured the dominance of Rome's clerics in this world, not to mention their wealth, once indulgences could be sold. By the time I was born, the defensive theological aggression of Nulla Salus had been rekindled among Catholics by anti-Catholic animosities left over from the Protestant Reformation, as well as the anti-clerical revolutions that had roiled the 19th century, especially in Europe. Roman Catholicism, despite being the faith of peasants, was identified with the Ancien Regime, and it was brutally targeted throughout Europe. You know this. In America, immigrant Catholics Wops, Polacks, Dagos, and especially Mix, could strike back at excluding non-Catholic bigots <coughs> by emphasizing, even celebrating, that we, the hated Papists, could get to heaven. The beatific vision was our eternal revenge. To hell with Protestants, 
and their hilltop houses and prep schools, Jews with their interest rates and revolutions be damned. All well and good. But now, it was really hitting me. Peter? How could God not like Peter as much as I did? That simple question stuck in my throat. What had Peter done to merit an eternity of hellfire? Nothing. Nothing at all. If he was not a good boy, how could I be a good boy? Looking at things through the crystal lens of my friend's certain fate, I saw that the God who ruled over a cosmos defined by no salvation outside the church, and this was a seven-year-old's ultimate indictment, such a God was unfair. No fair. Now, when I awoke, from the dream of falling, it was the horror of Peter's fate that choked me. Peter, forever in the lake of fire, that I knew this awaited him while he did not know, made me feel complicit in the injustice which only compounded my anguish. Eventually, I would look back on this uninformed but visual grasp of the injustice of what awaited a certain Jew as the opening to a rejection of the entire economy of religious anti-Judaism. The Christian roots of the Holocaust had indeed haunted the work I had done as a writer across 50 years. But that work began with Peter. I came to understand the importance of insisting both on the Nazis' unique responsibility for the anti-Jewish genocide but also on the way in which the Nazi project built on the prior abomination of sacrosanct Christian demonizing of Jews. Christian anti-Judaism not only spawned Nazi anti-Semitism, but underwrote the Christian world's broad indifference to the fate of the six million. Taking for granted as proper the otherworldly Jewish future in the eternal lake of fire prepared Christians to take for granted the this-worldly Jewish destiny in the crematoria. Today's explosive moral confrontation with the sexual dysfunction of Catholic clergy has its roots in the ancient church's denigration of women and the related spurning of normal erotic desire. But the church's original sin concerned not sex, but the Jews. The legacy of that religiously justified bigotry showed itself during World War II. But until the facade of unimpeachable Catholic virtue was stripped from the church in this 21st century, over the last 15 to 20 years, with the priestly sex abuse crisis, the full meaning of the church's 20th century failure in Europe could be deflected. After the war, the church mostly fixed responsibility for the Nazi crime on a relatively small number of Germans, an act of disavowal symbolized by the still preceding cause, cause of elevating the wartime Pope, Pius XII, to sainthood. His blatant anti-Semitism and his failure to act upon his early knowledge of the genocide have not been enough to disqualify him from canonization. That's because declaring Pius XII a saint would have less to do with whitewashing his personal record than with exonerating the church itself and its anti-Jewish theology for its larger co-responsibility for the Holocaust. This sort of deflection amounts to the church's foremost moral malady. But by an odd and entirely unpredictable accident of biography, I was inoculated against it when I caught a bare but unforgotten whiff of its fetid rot at the very outset of my life of faith. That Belhaven Country Club excluded Peter and his family because they were Jews befouled what had been my little slice of paradise up the road. And all at once my dream of high heaven 
began to smell bad too. My unwilled reaction of pure doctrinal rejection, no to no salvation outside the church, amounted to my taking my friend's side against the unjust God. I knew, of course, that that qualified as the sin that would damn me too. In truth, long after such calculations have lost their rational bite, I have yet to shake the feeling, the sure feeling of unworthiness that swamped me then. Oddly, this repugnant set of recognitions had immediately brought its own consolation, a consolation that also remains. For who would want to go to heaven and be expected to sit blissfully for all eternity at the feet of a monster who would create hell and fill it with good people like my friend? I never spoke of this to Peter or to anyone, certainly not to a nun or to a priest in the confessional. But to myself, the realization could not have been more clear or more permanent. I was a bad Catholic. At the age of seven, my secret life of disbelief had begun. That might have been the end of my journey of faith, with my leaving religion behind as soon as I could, as so many others have. But instead, something happened not only to rescue my faith, but to brace it with an apparatus of hope that has kept me in the Catholic Church for most of my life. And once again, the nuns of St. Mary's School were instrumental. I was in the third grade, so a year or so after I proposed going to the swimming pool with Peter. Each week began at St. Mary's with the school principal coming into our classroom to give us a summary of what she called the Catholic news. She was Sister Mita Elaine. And that I remember her name is no doubt a measure of the mark her words made on me one day. Mostly the news, she announced, involved such sources of Catholic pride as Pope Pius XII on the cover of Time magazine, or Notre Dame star halfback Johnny Latner winning the Heisman Trophy, or an Academy Award nomination for the movie The Miracle of Our Lady of Fatima. But this day was different. With unchecked surprise, Sister told us that a priest in Boston had been excommunicated by the Holy Father for teaching that there is no salvation outside the church. She did not explain. I had no idea where Boston was. I grasped the full import of that word, excommunicated. Catholic version of the death sentence. I rushed home with this news. Mom, Mom, I said as I ran into the house. They excommunicated a priest for teaching no salvation outside the church. My mother at the ironing board said calmly, I heard. But I thought that's what we believed. It was, she said. What do we believe now? And she replied calmly, we believe, live and let live, and leave the rest to God. So simple, so true. There was nothing more to be said. This was my salvation. I remember looking out the window toward Peter's house. I had an impulse to rush across the yard to find him, to tell him this stupendous news. I had no words for its implications, didn't understand it, but I implicitly caught the meaning of this in full. The church had somehow changed its rule, or God's rule, 
God was not a monster after all. If Peter was not inevitably damned, neither was I. This was rescue not only of the destiny of two boys, but of an essential idea about our Father in heaven. He was, after all, the loving Father of us all, Jews included. If our idea of God could have been so wrong, perhaps so could our idea of hell. But of course, having never broached with Peter the subject of his damnation, much less my own, it was unthinkable that I would tell him now of this reprieve. Years later, I would understand how this elemental revolution in Catholic theology had come about, a deep and further instance of the broad post-war movement from parochialism to pluralism that was even then reshaping the religious imagination and not just of Catholics. In brief, the Archbishop of, Co of Boston, Richard Cushing, had a sister named Dolly, a token taker at the MTA. Dolly had married a Jewish fellow named Dick Perlstein, who was a haberdasher with his brother. Even though theirs was thus a bad marriage, Cushing's bond with his sister was unbroken, and he had dinner most Sundays at Dolly's table. The archbishop had come to love his brother-in-law, a good man. And leaving doctrine aside, he effectively took for granted that God loved Dick Pearlstein too. Cushing was offended when Dick reported on the foul anti-Semitic insults he heard from a street preaching priest near his workplace in Boston. Offended for Dick, Cushing looked into it. That priest was Father Leonard Feeney. He was known for mounting a soapbox on Boston Common beside a poster that read, No Salvation Outside the Church. Feeney aimed his dogma diatribes mainly at Jews. The Christ-killer Jews were damned. Cushing was outraged for his brother-in-law and he ordered Feeney to stop. When Feeney cited the Catholic deposit of doctrine and refused over a year of back and forth, Cushing excommunicated him. Feeney had Cushing now, and he immediately appealed to Rome, confident of the 1,500 years of magisterial teaching on his side. No salvation outside the church was doctrine, if anything was. But the Holy See unexpectedly upheld Cushing's ban. Feeney was excommunicated by Rome. And that was the Catholic news we heard that day from Sister Rita Elaine. In a distinction most of us missed, the Vatican was careful to make clear that a priest's disobedience of his ordinary was at issue in the Feeney case, not doctrine. But the ruling was properly taken everywhere as a turn away from Catholicism's doom-laden exclusivism. My mother, showing the distance she had traveled from St. Gabe's in Chicago, had gotten it just right, live and let live, although the implications of this new ecumenism would only play out gradually. Where once Catholics and most Christians emphasized what's called the incarnation, as the exclusive revelation of God, with conscious attachment to Jesus as the exclusive mode of access to God, now we Christians more typically emphasize the creation as the way in which the creator is immediately present to conscious human beings. Jesus came to reveal 
that we creatures ourselves are the manifestations of God's reality. And there are many, many ways that humans express this. Despite gospel verses that seem to suggest otherwise, Jesus is not the only way to God. The various non-Christian religions can be mediators of the Holy One, but so can secular expressions of ultimate reality, which after all is the purpose of great art and music. For Christians, Jesus remains a unique savior who somehow, somehow participates in the divinity of being God's son. But what he reveals is that the one he calls Father is intimately present to all humanity. Jesus saves us by revealing against what we had thought through sin that we are all already saved. Our faith in Jesus is himself somehow, our faith that Jesus is himself somehow God amounts to faith that all persons can somehow be taken up in divinity Indeed, we believe that is human destiny. Therefore, all people have the absolute right to be free from every form of coercion in matters of faith, physical coercion for sure, but also the social and psychological coercion that accompany threats of damnation. We, the church, had gotten all of this very wrong. Though I knew nothing of how this changed way of thinking came about, I had, I had instinctively grasped the largest point, even as a child. My experience of Peter Sisman as a friend who was worthy of love weighed more than any doctrine that banned him a priori from the love of God. This was experience over doctrine, a religious version of the Enlightenment flip that gave us the scientific method. This reversal in the Feeney case showed that a modern Catholic transformation was already underway. It would come to some fulfillment a decade later when no salvation outside the church was solemnly renounced by the Pope and all the world's bishops at the Second Vatican Council. It is not incidental to this Boston story that the key figure in demanding of the Council Fathers that they changed this doctrine was that same Archbishop, Cardinal Richard Cushing, who brought his experience of his Jewish brother-in-law to Rome. Cushing, for whom I would later work as a priest in Boston, led the way in arguing for the two most important council declarations, both issued in 1965, and both affecting the church's relationship one could say transforming the church's relationship with the Jewish people. One was Nostra Aetate, of which you know very well, in our time, which renounced the Christ killer slander against the Jews, what had first stoked anti-Jewishness in my own imagination as a child. The other was Dignitatis Humanae, on the dignity of the human person, which affirmed the primacy of conscience not church membership, as determinative of salvation. Speaking of salvation, the Second Vatican Council, when I experienced it as an uncertain seminarian in the early 1960s, would save my faith in the Roman Catholic Church. A reprieve, alas, that is being sorely tested now by this sex abuse crisis. The Council's reform, in its own terms, alas, would be undercut by Vatican authorities in short order. But I would never forget how it and Cushing gave me a way out from under the fear and trembling of my forbidden disbelief when I chose Peter over God. But as the slaughter of Jews at prayer in the Tree of Life Synagogue in Pittsburgh reminds us, our culture is far from finished with anti-Semitism. And part of the reason that is true is that Christianity, including Roman Catholicism, is not finished with its anti-Judaism. The changes enacted by the Second Vatican Council 
and then affirmed by mainstream Christian denominations of all stripes in relation to the Jewish people represent a beginning, not a completion. Since the Council, a succession of popes had dramatically reached out to the Jewish community, and there had been a resounding set of moral acknowledgments, apologies, by various members of the hierarchy. There has been a transformation in official church teaching about the Jews and Judaism. From changes in the catechism to a Vatican renunciation of the mandate to work for the conversion of Jews. But to repeat, all of this amounts to the start, not the finish. As one who has found himself in the pews most weeks across the years since these changes began to be made, I myself am frankly troubled by a broad and continuing complacency in the wider church ecumenically defined when it comes to Christian attitudes about Jews and Judaism. That is especially true when it comes to the way preachers typically elucidate the scriptures, the conscious lessons that congregations inevitably draw from such preaching, and the unexamined assumptions about the meaning of Jesus Christ that continue to subtly undercut right relations between Jews and Christians. Something is wrong still. To illustrate what I mean, let me tell you another Boston story, centrally involving the Irish again. A more recent story. On March 11, 2016, a Friday night, the basketball teams of two Boston area high schools met for a high stakes semifinal championship game, Catholic Memorial versus Newton North, two superb and highly regarded high schools. Tensions were mounting as students from both schools packed the gym. That the Catholic Memorial student body is all boys incited some of the Newton North kids to chant an offensive taunt. Where are your girls? Where are your girls? Then they escalated it with the apparently homophobic off-color taunt, Sausage Fest. Something thrown in, let's call it, for bad measure. Kids being kids. High spirits, rude manners. But that is when a startling thing happened. From the Catholic Memorial side of the gym came a rebuttal chant involving school officials later acknowledged something like 75 students. And what was it? The Catholics, many of them Irish Catholics, loudly aimed a scathing accusation against the opposition throng of Newton North students. You killed Jesus. You killed Jesus. You killed Jesus. The rhythm took hold. You killed Jesus. You killed Jesus. Newton is a middle to upper middle class suburb. Yes, some Jews live there. Newton North is a public high school. Apparently to Catholic Memorial students, Jewishness is a main note of the school's identity. But what does it signal? that when confronted with an adolescent challenge from rivals, these Catholic young people, well on their way to an excellent education, already the products in most cases of extensive religious instruction in the spirit of Vatican II, had immediately an instinctive, immediate and instinctive recourse to a lowest drawer anti-Jewish slur. When had you killed Jesus rung out more expected, unexpectedly? The ghost of Father Feeney was no doubt pleased. Catholic Memorial won the basketball game, heading for the Metro Championship game. But for days after the brouhaha, the citywide conversation was dominated by shock at what the Catholic chanters had done. As it happened, the day before, on March 10th, Cardinal Sean O'Malley, one of Cushing's successors as Archbishop of Boston, 
had participated at Temple Emmanuel in Newton in a 50th anniversary observance of Nostra Aetate. The Cardinal proposed that we all work together to build a civilization of love. And his heart heartfelt goodwill had edified those who heard him. But a day later, Boston could wonder what kind of civilization is actually being built. Where had that foul anti-Jewish taunt come from? A full half century after the deicide charge had been formally renounced by the Catholic Church. On the following Monday, the administrators of Catholic Memorial announced that the school's student body would be punished for the anti-Semitic chant by being forbidden to attend the follow-up championship game. The administrators issued a statement that read, there are no excuses for the actions of the student spectators who took part in the chanting. Their behavior was appalling. Their actions and words do not align with the teachings or the value system of our school or the Catholic Church. But despite Nostra Aetate and all the amazing progress accomplished by the Jewish Catholic dialogue, which in Boston has been exemplary, one must still ask, is that so? It's the question that was being asked in Pittsburgh. How deeply into the consciousness of the ordinary faithful has the transformation of Vatican II on this urgent question actually penetrated? To ask the question in a more pointed way, does the Reformed theology of Vatican II actually outweigh the ongoing impact of troubling anti-Jewish gospel texts that seem to contradict it? How has the reforming post Nostra Aetate scholarship, even when paired with reconciling, pronoun reconciling pronouncements of popes and bishops, actually influenced the attitudes of legions of Christian preachers, decisively including Catholics, who routinely failed to measure those texts against the new theology that would force a change in how they are read and heard. Exactly two weeks after the notorious basketball game in Boston, the Christian world celebrated Good Friday. Let his blood be upon us and upon our children. The anti-Jewish texts of the Passion narrative are re reiterated with power every year. The boys and young men of Catholic Memorial High School may or may not have been taught about Nostra Aetate, but they have certainly, year in and year out, been present for the reading of the Passion, as I was in my earliest years back in Virginia. Have those students been enabled to hear that anti-Jewish narrative as if they themselves were Jews? Have they been helped to understand how those texts came to be written, and when, and by whom? Not by eyewitnesses reporting facts shortly after the death of Jesus, but by successor generations filtering memory through theology and through the traumas of the Civil War? Have the Catholic Memorial students been helped to understand that the polemical authors of that denigrating phrase, the Jews, which appears 87 times in the Gospels, were themselves Jews? Have the Catholic young people, in some, been provided with the critical mindset necessary to hear the passion without concluding that the Jews killed Jesus. For Christians everywhere, this is a grave question. Reading the Bible literally as the word of God, as most Christians around the globe do, rooted in simplistic notions of historicity and facticity, inevitably produces negative attitudes toward the Jews portrayed as villains. And the passion narratives are only the tip of the iceberg. 
an uncritical reading of the New Testament taken as a whole can seem to put Jesus in ontological opposition to his own people as so in opposition to his own people as to make any sense of his authentic and permanent Jewishness impossible. Christian contempt for Jews begins in Christian contempt for the Judaism of Jesus, as if he were somehow not a faithful, we would say, orthodox Jew to the day he died. That contempt continues to be sacralized when the letters of St. Paul are read as justifying a polarizing opposition that begins by setting grace against law or faith against works, but ends by setting the church against the synagogue in an enmity willed by a Christian New Testament God of love in conflict with a Jewish Old Testament God of judgment. This us against them structure of thought with Jews embodying a cosmic negative other is a mutated gene in the DNA of the Western imagination and no, its damaging consequences are not finished with. This problem is hardly ever addressed. Yes, Cardinal O'Malley was right to lift up in Temple Emmanuel in Newton the hope for a civilization of love. But that assumes a next phase of a massive Christian religious education that has yet to really begin. It matters urgently that young people, Catholic young people, not be ushered into an old room furnished with images of anti-Jewish contempt. As the Holocaust made very clear, images of contempt are lethal. Nostra Aetate renounced the most blatant of those images, you killed Jesus. But it left unfinished the task of uprooting its source in the oppositional structure of mind that I just described. Jews will not be safe from the insult of anti-Judaism or the violence of anti-Semitism until this further pro project of theological transformation is much more fully undertaken throughout the Christian world. I said a moment ago that the ghost of Father Feely, Feeney negatively haunts this discussion. For me, there is a positive haunting, and that comes from the memory of my first friend, Peter. His simple human goodness registered with me so powerfully that it outweighed the doctrines of my church. I chose Peter over God, which should have damned me. But then Cardinal Cushing chose Dick Pearlstein over God. That was, in the words of the old spiritual, the hour I first believed. It's not too much to say that Peter gave me my faith not in the God who damns and against whom I chose, but in the God who is faithful to all that God has made and to everyone. The God, of course, of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, who is the God of Jesus. Blessed be his holy name. Yes, sir, please. Isn't the them and us uh, dichotomy so common to all religions? Not just.
Christianity, Islam, uh, the things that are going on now with the Rohingyas and the Hindus, and the, I mean, the murders that gone on in the name of religion, the division of India in 1947, and a million Muslims and Hindus kill each other. It just seems how all religions that's built in, there's somebody outside, there's somebody inside, there's somebody saved, there's someone not saved. It was as common to Protestantism as to Catholicism. It's the, it's the rationale now for Muslim extremism. So it, it goes beyond getting out of this out of Christianity. Sure. Well, you're, you're, you're absolutely right to invite me to broaden out the observation. Nietzsche derided Christianity for carrying forward Plato's distinction between the ideal and the real. The oppositional structure of that as a kind of ground of the human imagination. I'm talking about a particular form of this. Uh, we could track it back to prehistory and tribalism, the way in which, in order to survive, we had to know who was, who was in our clan and who wasn't. And we defined, we defined ourselves over against those who were not. I mean, it's a structure of the imagination, no doubt about it. What's different and, and what belongs to us in a powerful way is this, <clears throat> the invitation from the biblical tradition is for something else. The genius observation of, from Genesis forward is that God is the creator, not of the tribe, but of the cosmos. That is a principle of a kind of, uh, of, of pluralism. Uh, the God we worship is not our God over against their God. The God we worship is the God of all. Now, we know that in the name of monotheism, uh, crimes have been committed as we try to impose our God on others, but that doesn't take away from this act of resistance that's rooted in the Bible, and Jesus comes out of that. And Jesus, whatever Jesus represented, and you know, we're historians are uh, transfixed by the impossibility of actually getting to the historical Jesus. But the thing that the people who followed him could not forget somehow was the way in which he represented a relief from, you could say salvation from, the traditional dichotomies of human existence. Traditional dichotomies of class, gender, tribe, ethnicity, religion. Whenever we know of Jesus, he stood against that. The symbol of that was the way in which the story of Jesus is told as a story of the end of scapegoating. Because scapegoating is the use of one of those who are not part of us. We dump all of our negative energy on that one, drive him out, drive her out, kill them, sacrifice them, Jesus, the innocent scapegoating, comes to put an end to scapegoating by revealing it for what it is. And in telling the story of the end of scapegoating, the followers of Jesus scapegoated. That's the built-in tragedy here. A revelation of how deep into the human condition this dichotomizing structure of the imagination goes. In its first generation, the church wasn't immune from it, which we see in the Gospels as the Gospels find this need to demonize ones who, later readers of the text, who are not Jewish, um, the Jews. Christianity, biblical faith, is nothing if it isn't an act of resistance to this. And if there's a tragedy embedded in the biblical faith, it's the way in which even those who adhere to it are at the mercy of this of this habit of the mind. Am I addressing yeah, no, your I, question? I, I, I agree. I'm a pessimist when it comes to the human race because I'm watching Buddhism to me is the most gentle religion in the world. And now you have Buddhists committing genocide against Rohingya Muslims. So it just seems, you know, anytime there's them and us, this is built into, as you were saying, that Nietzsche, there has to be, it's almost like human beings can't exist without them. And this is us. This belongs to us. I understand. And that's, I absolutely agree with those readings. I mean, in church, it's, uh, I've been at weddings and it's funerals. It's so embarrassing when the Jews are there to hear, you know, the, the biblical, the New Testament references. And sometimes priests will do what you do; they'll explain it. But the fact that they have to explain it, yeah, it's amazing, isn't it? That they, that this is like the root of all. But that's, I agree with it. It's yeah. not going to change till that's addressed. 
Other comments or questions? Yes, ma'am. The, uh, There's a microphone coming yeah. out. The document you got was at least filtered through a theology that was thought out and thought to be rational unto itself, as opposed to current American trends to fundamentalism, which are the word as written, only in English, of course, uh, and are preached by um, not the sophisticated analysis that filters. Could you comment on a hope for creating a state of love, a government of love, as we go forward? Well, <clears throat> I love your question, and you, 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 you invite us to elevate our our conversation. Um, my, my hopes are more modest. Uh, a government of love would be great. But, I mean, a government of justice would be starting. But, yeah. Um, but the, the simple, there are certain simple things that would help us enormously. For example, the, the, the spreading out of what, what's called scholars and others call historical consciousness, so that we understand that what the world we live in has a history. It wasn't always like this, and it, <coughs> certain things happened to make it like this, and those things might have happened in another way. There's nothing absolute about the world we live in. It's just, it, as with the principle of evolution itself, it's a, it's a product of random selection in so many ways. And so to take the example on the table, the gospel denigrations of the Jews, it, it's, it's urgently important to know that between the first gospel, Mark, was written down in the year 70, the last gospel, John, was written down in the year somewhere around 110. So what was going on? That's the text. What was the context? What was going on between 70 and 110? The first Holocaust, the savage Roman war against the Jewish people that destroyed Jerusalem and the temple in 70, as Mark is being written, the Gospel of Mark was a response to the destruction of the temple. In the Gospel of Mark, we hear Jesus describe himself as the new temple. Why is that? He predicts, he's seen predicting in chapter 13 of Mark, the destruction of the temple. Not one stone will be left upon the other, Jesus says, pointing to this. And he's rebuked by his listeners by saying that, that temple has stood for a thousand years. What, what do you? Well, that's a, he, they're talking about what happened right there. The war has been launched, and by the time the Gospel of John is written in a hundred, uh, you know, f a, a generation later, the war of Rome against the Jews that killed historians tell us something like a million Jews all over the Roman Empire. That by the time the Gospel of John was written that Roman war against the Jews had generated a civil war among the Jews, as imperial wars almost always do. Why are the Israelis and Palestinians at war with each other? You can't answer that question without including the factor of the British Empire's exploitation of Palestine in the early 20th century. Why are the Irish Catholics against the Irish Protestants? You can't begin to answer that question without including in your analysis the imperial uh, oppression of the forces from London, and so on. So Jesus, a non-Jew, remembered as an enemy of the Jewish people is a perception that came about in the course of an intra-Jewish civil war. And the Gospels are literature of that civil war. And, and until we understand that, we can't begin to understand how it came to be written this way. And the most important proclamation, therefore, of the good news is not that the Jesus people are loving people who are all good and all virtuous. The Jesus people are human beings just like everybody else, at the mercy of the same temptations. Therefore, so are we. Therefore, we shouldn't be so slow to acknowledge our anti-Semitism. We Catholics shouldn't be so slow to acknowledge our grotesque failures during World War II in Europe, and so forth. So historical consciousness, as opposed to the assumption that it was always like this, and our duty is to make sure it never changes from this, because this is the way God made it. 
That's creationism applied to history. And that's what has the it has a, a grip of the Christian imagination globally, certainly in the evangelical world, but also in the Catholic world. Still, this is the war that, or the conflict that's going on within the Roman Catholic Church now. Uh, and it has enormous import for the future of the human species because there are more than a billion Roman Catholics. And whether this institution goes forward into history rational, uh, purged of superstition, purged of ahistorical thinking, whether it goes forward critically and uh, affirming pluralism as opposed to intolerance, the human species will not, I believe, will not survive an unreformed, irrational, reactionary Roman Catholicism. There are just too many. There are just too many people. And it's it's the largest NGO in the world. It's the most powerful educational institution in the world, except NYU. <laughs> and it matters, which is why the church's argument with itself is so important, which is why the current collapse of church authority is so doubly tragic and dangerous. Sorry for that diatribe. <laughs> Other comments or questions? Yes, yes ma'am, right here, please. Um, I have a, a question and a comment, and maybe it's only fair if I ask. Please. So we'll start with the question. Um, the, when you look at Jewish history in relation to Christian persecution, what you see when you take a total picture is that Jews were never historically persecuted in any really serious institutional way in Protestant countries. Um, certainly not along the lines and to the extent that they have been in Catholic countries throughout the ages. And a suggestion that has been made for this by, um, by Israeli scholars is that um, because Protestantism tends to emphasize the living Jesus, whereas Catholicism emphasizes Christ on the cross and Mary's suffering, that this is possibly the reason why there is a strong theological bent toward anti-Jewish rhetoric within the Catholic Church. What do you think of that? Do you, would you agree with that, or do you think that is, is that an attitude? So I address that, and then you'll offer your comments? Yeah. OK. Sure. So uh, well, it's an interesting point of view. It's, it's not quite historical, though, because it was, after all, in Lutheran Germany that Christian right. anti-Judaism became genocidal. Right, the, the, the one exception being that they... Yeah, it's an important exception. Martin, <laughs> Martin, Martin Luther, uh, with the distinction, uh, I think the distinction where that is more salient, in my view, is the distinction between the Lutheran tradition and the Calvinist tradition. Mm -hmm. So John Calvin's, the churches and uh, cultural institutions that derive from John Calvin, like the secular United States of America, with its emphasis on compact and the contract of the Constitution, uh, Calvin a lawyer, um, uh, the, the arrival of Jews in the New World in a Calvinist, with a Calvinist emphasis, the Puritans, the New England, New York, Virginia, the Calvinist tradition of the congregation, uh, without a, demonized, a tradition of demonizing Jews, um, the Lutheran tradition is very different, and you can see it right there in Martin Luther, which is a, another moment of a deep tragedy in the Western story, because you recall about Luther that he was he he uh, began his complaint against Roman Catholicism by defending Jews. Uh, his one of his first great treatises, published around 1520, I think, or so. If, so within a couple of years of the 95 Theses, was called that Jesus Christ was born a Jew, which is the key, the key insight, of course, when Christianity, the Christian imagination, forgot that, thought of Jesus as a Gentile. I used to, I, when I'm teaching undergraduates, I always began by saying, what religion was Jesus? And I, you know, uh, I was Catholic. <laughs> I was the, what religion was Jesus? And, it, you know, people, you could see, and I, um, one day I 
I uh, varied the question by asking students, uh, what religion were the Romans? And it, you know, kind of a sea of blank faces, and finally a young man raised his hand and said, the Romans killed Jesus, right? And I thought, well, there's someone who's been paying attention. It wasn't the Jews, it was the Romans, right? And I said, that's right. And he said, so they were Jews. <laughs> so, I mean, what, my, I digress. My, my largest point is that that distinction between Roman Catholicism and Protestantism isn't as subtle as it needs to be. The second point is that it's absolutely true that the Latin Catholic tradition emphasized the death of Jesus over, especially, not so much in contrast to the Protestantism, but in contrast to the Orthodox tradition in the East, where the central, the Protestants took the corpus off the cross, but the cross is still the central icon of Protestant piety. Catholics have the corpus on the cross, Protestants don't. In the East, the central icon is the icon face of Jesus. The death of Jesus is not central. The resurrection of Jesus is what's central in the East. Now, Eastern Orthodoxy, the Russians, for example, have a savage history of anti-Semitism, too. So none of these traditions are free of scapegoating and demonizing the Jewish people. And I, I believe it all goes back to the Gospels, because they're all, they're all, everyone takes off from that narrative, from the perception of the passion. Uh, yeah. Why, why uh, it was in the West that anti-Semitism became genocidal, and in the West it was Germany that was the center of the genocide, as opposed to, for example, Italy, which was savagely anti-Semitic, but ambivalent about, uh, let's give them at least that much credit, ambivalent about the genocide. Yeah, but I think that, that brings me to my second point, which is that you had mentioned Nazism in the same vein What, what has to be said though about Nazism is that it, it broke with the Christian tradition of, you know, very clearly when Hitler declared that the Nazis as leaders were barbarians and wanted to be barbarians. That's what he said. It's the Bob Rock and then Bob Rock and John. And this, the, the pagan tradition was very much more at work rather than Christianity. I mean, yes, the Lutheran church capitulated immediately, but the fact of the matter is, is that the genocidal part of it was was not something that Christianity had ever practiced before just in terms of sheer numbers of a wholesale death manufacturer that was at work there. So I think that the, the pagan roots of German culture were much more, I mean, yes, they were demonizing yes. Jews and everything, but as far as the actual act, the deed of, of of the genocide, I, I don't think that that is something that that you can speak about without bringing up the pagan element, which is very. You're absolutely strong. correct. Mm -hmm. I, I couldn't agree more, and mm -hmm. it, I, I I should have been more emphatic in not laying off the Nazi genocide on Christianity. That's not what I meant to be understood as saying. The Nazis, with, especially with that neo-pagan um, kind of uh, false pseudo-Darwinian notion of. Uh, eugenics and so forth, brought a lethal brew that was apart from Christianity and the Christian tradition that led to the genocide. You're absolutely right to emphasize that. You made the observation that Nazism broke from Christianity. My observation, what I'm grappling with, is the way in which Christianity did not break from Nazism. The, yeah. way, in which, the way in which the churches, Catholic, Protestant, the churches cooperated were passive to cooperating with the Nazi project. Uh, and that's, that's the call to conscience I'm trying to respond to. So em emphasize always the particular Nazi responsibility for the genocide, but also acknowledge that it would not have been carried to the point that it was carried if it weren't for both the long tradition of religious anti-Judaism on which contempt for Jews built and the passivity or active complicity of the broad population of Christian Europe. Both of those things are coming out of the tradition of religious anti-Judaism.
But I'm sure that as a scholar of, of this, you know, Constantine Ford and other things, we know that among, between and among different European countries, the response to the Holocaust was vastly different from country to country. And, and Ireland was highly problematic because as the one neutral European country, they rejected Jews rather than accepting them and giving them a haven. So, yeah. I mean, they have basically very little moral compass with which to be criticizing Jews in Ireland. It's true. And, and that is a theme that is really not dealt with. It's true. Um, in any place that I can see, particularly not by the Jewish community, interestingly enough. That's a separate question. Uh, yeah. I'd love to hear more about your thought about that. Yes, in the back, please, sir. I have uh, two comments and questions. So the first comment is thank you. I enjoyed this. Um, the second comment is to address um, the first person who I can't see, but I'm a pessimist. Um, so I, I don't disagree, but I, sitting in the lecture, um, it, was, it kind of struck me that um, Catholics or Christians, but especially Catholics, which I am, um, they have a very personal relationship with Jesus, who lives lived on Earth, whereas maybe other religions don't. And as you were describing earlier, um, your wrestling as a young child, I forget what age, about about Saint Peter. Um, Catholic children are raised with this personal relationship, and then they hear at the Passion. The play you all hear that talks about you know crucifying crucified, and they may not know how to process it. They grow up without necessarily direction, just their own understanding that might color some of these um, anti-Jewish feelings growing up. So I just kind of struck me that way <coughs> that it could just be like independent, natural, if if not doctrine. Yeah. Um, and then my question was. Um, I'm a little younger and I'm from New York, but I don't know if I'm Cushing. Did you get to meet him and what was he like? Cushing? Well, I, how close did you get? Oh, I didn't. Uh, I met him, he didn't meet me. <laughs> <laughs> um, when I became, I was Catholic chaplain at Boston University from 1969 to 1974. He ended his tenure as the Archbishop in 1970, so for the first year of my ministry, he was the boss. And he was a wonderful man. A truly wonderful man. I'll tell you one quick story. The big problem war in Vietnam, uh, Catholic students, I was the Catholic chaplain, so young men in, at Boston University who wanted to become conscientious objectors to the war in Vietnam who had uh, almost no ability to, to get the deferment because draft boards refused to recognize applications from Catholics because the Catholic Church was officially on record as approving the just war, this is a just war, and the Catholic hierarchy of America was vociferous in its support of, uh, of the war in Vietnam, especially Cardinal Spellman, famously the Archbishop of New York, until 1968. So draft boards were routinely dismissing Catholic boys, and there was, it, was, it was outrageous because both the Vatican Council and Pope John XXIII's uh, encyclical Pachmenteris established the principle of Catholic conception objection, but people didn't know it. I was with a, uh, I and a couple of other campus ministers who were dealing with this problem asked to see the cardinal. We went to see him, and we explained this, and we said, "You, if you made a powerful statement saying Catholic boys have a right to follow their conscience, a duty to follow their conscience, to be good Catholics." It will be. A, it will help. And two, uh, two or three weeks later, it happened to be Easter, and he issued a pastoral letter on Easter uh, addressing that subject, and it made news. And it, uh, and and from then on, when Catholic boys came to me, I gave them a packet of materials to submit to the draft board. One of which was a letter from Cardinal Cushing, a pastoral letter that was read in all the churches of Boston. That's an example of, of this man. I mean, aside from all the wonderful personality stuff about him, uh, he was, and, and his a tremendous uh, impact at the Second Vatican Council, where um, his, he arrived with great authority. He brought uh, you know, some of the great uh, 
um, Catholic impulses of the American church uh, with him. Um, he was a human being also, <laughs> and quite, quite clearly flawed. It's odd for a cardinal. I mean, you know, <laughs> Say it again? It's very odd when a cardinal is a human being. Oh, yeah, <laughs> right. So thank you for your question. Anyone else? Yes, please. This may be our last one because I, I want people to be able to have a glass of wine downstairs. Okay, Rob. Well, I was surprised when I was in this. The old, the old joke that, of course, uh, Christ was Irish because at the, at the wedding when they ran out of alcohol, they, uh, yeah. they all said, uh, I'm surprised. Yeah. Anyway, it seems like a sad chapter in American history that was in the 1920s, and correct me if I'm wrong. With the resurgence of the Ku Klux Klan, of course they had the you know Catholics in their in their targets. But then by the 1930s we had Father Coughlin, and who as I understand it was pretty popular. <laughs> yeah. At a lot of large. So it seems like instead of saying, you know, during the twenties the, the Catholics and the Jews were targeted, but then by the thirties the is it accurate to say that many of Catholics kind of with the prodding of people like Charles Coughlin, you know, turned against the Jews in America. Yes, well, Catholics were targeted by the nativists and the know-nothings and the Klan as part of their targeting of immigrants, people from away. Right. Uh, but, and Coughlin uh, was a, a kind of phenomenon uh, coming out of that, a kind of uh, a footnote in a way to that, to that bigotry, kind of proving that Catholics could be every bit as bigoted as the Klan. <laughs> Coughlin made, brought to a kind of masterpiece level the, the double slur against the Jewish people. They're the bankers who control the finance of the world, and they're the revolutionaries who want to overthrow the bankers who control the finance of the world. So Jews are demonized from both ends of the political imaginative spectrum. And that was, Card that was a staple of Cardinal Coughlin's preaching, and no one ever seem to point out the contradiction uh, to him. Uh, Coughlin is one of the shameful chapters of Roman Catholicism, and we should know it better. Feeney wasn't, didn't have the reach of, Catholic, of, of Coughlin because he didn't own his own radio station, which Coughlin did. Uh, so Coughlin was a first media celebrity. He was a kind of Rush Limbaugh figure uh, in this country. Imagine, imagine. Uh, he was an arch enemy of Roosevelt. Um, you know, slurred Roosevelt as a Jew, which was the nastiest thing you could think to say about him. Um, and, you know, the Catholic Church was in, and the Catholic hierarchy was ambivalent about Coughlin. He was tremendously popular with the uh, ordinary Catholic people. Eventually, uh, gratefully, They became ashamed of him. We became ashamed of him. He was succeeded by Joe McCarthy, mm -hmm. another Irish Catholic, with a, a similar venom about him, who was enormously popular, but then eventually, seen for what he was, we became ashamed of him. It's, uh, it's an interesting story. If you, you could just track the Irish-American story on some of these great figures, and the, one of the most potent terms in the story, of course. This is why we have to return again and again to understand the marvel and the mystery of the arrival of the Kennedys, because they, they come out of the same, the same culture, the same world of intolerance, no salvation outside the church, and they, uh, they transcend it instinctively. Um, in fact, uh, John Kennedy and then his brother Robert were both enemies of Father Feeney, who was a kind of quasi-chaplain at Harvard when they were there. And in the early 1940s, uh, one of the founders of the St. Benedict House, which was Feeney's Catholic student center at Harvard, was a young, fierce Catholic who saw himself as opposed to the kind of Catholic John Kennedy was, who was, if they weren't in the same class, they were close, was Avery Dulles who was the founder of Benedict House, which was Father Feeney. And Avery Dulles went on then to have a tremendous, you remember, he was a young convert, his father famously, John Foster Dulles. So 
you know, we Catholics loved to collect celebrity converts uh, in those days. So Claire Booth Luce, oh my goodness, you know. Uh, John Foster Dulles' son, yes! Uh, and, and then, but John Foster Dulles' son became a fiercely reactionary, intolerant, apluralistic Catholic. Uh, he became a Jesuit, and as you know, then was transformed by the Second Vatican Council and went on to become a very distinguished theologian of the council and eventually made a cardinal without being a bishop. And that's, his story began with Father Feeney. So it's a story, speaking of history, of transformation, of transformation and transformation. And it's a good thing to remember that we human beings have a tradition of surpassing ourselves because we have to have that uppermost in mind right now, don't we? That we have a tradition of surpassing ourselves. Well, let that be the last word. I want to I want to thank you all very much for your kind of attention. I wish you <laughs>